Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you and some of your half faces. It's good to see those as well. Those of you online, welcome. So glad you're joining us for worship here this morning. Anybody, uh, anybody uh, experience a loss of power with the storm? Oh, we got quite a few of you. Any of you who are still without power? Do we have a couple? Ah, we do have a couple. It's not just us. Um, so yeah, cold showers, exhilarating. That's, that's the word I'm choosing to use to uh, describe, uh, describe it. So anyway, uh, power will be restored. Such a, a fascinating uh, first world problem that we're dealing with for some of us and then others as Chris prayed. Uh, there are actually significant issues that are out there and I think sometimes we forget that. So please be praying for uh, each other. So it was uh, 1980s and it was in Taiwan and uh, the Aboriginal families were facing an especially difficult financial time. The circumstances, it, it was a very, very rough day for many, many families, so much so that some of the families in desperation were beginning to sell their daughters into prostitution in order to survive. And uh, experts believe that at the time there were 60,000 child prostitutes. And they were governed by a very powerful and brutal uh, crime syndicate in the day that was really running unchecked. I mean, Catherine Wu, she is a Mennonite uh, pastor in Taiwan and she was determined to rescue girls from this horror. And so she established the Good Shepherd Center in 1986. The design of it being that once a girl was rescued uh, out of uh, these uh, criminals' hands, that uh, they would be given life skills and training so that they wouldn't end up back in poverty and have to return to this oppressive lifestyle. And so it was one morning in 1993 when Pastor Catherine, she arrived at the center for work and seemingly out of nowhere, a few people jumped out, masked, hooded uh, people who then stuffed a rag in her mouth and beat her, leaving her nearly dead. It was a horrible, horrible story. Of course, she was doing so much good for the kingdom. When you hear a story like this, it seems so unfortunately uh, brutal. Well, her family and friends, while she was recovering in the hospital, they, they warned her, they pleaded with her. They said, you, you, next time, they will kill you. Catherine had made some very powerful enemies. So, how does one continue in the Christ life? How does one continue to walk with God, to nourish your soul? How does one continue to experience the power of God flowing through you despite such powerful enemies and such trying times. We're going to be looking at Psalm 5 today. I'm going to be reading primarily from the New Living Translation, Psalm 5. This is a psalm written by David. It was written as a prayer for the morning, and it was clear as we work our way through this that David very much was under attack from his enemies. So we'll see that kind of right out of the gate here, and then we'll see some other layers that we get to see in light of the New Testament. So Psalm chapter 5, verse 1. O Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my requests to you and wait expectantly. 
Let's stop there for a moment. So it doesn't matter how you get these prayers out. Get them out of you. Get them out and offer them up to God. There are so many words that, that the author uses here, that David uses here. He's, he's first, he cries out. He's like, hear me. He's saying, listen, God, he's trying, to, he's trying to make certain that he has the Almighty's attention. He's like, you've got to hear my prayers. There's a desperation in his request. He's saying, listen to me, hear me. And then he hits these words like groanings. Some translations, they use the word sighs. These are, these are the innermost thoughts that often are wordless. When you've struggled greatly, when you can't quite figure out what the next thing is you even ought to be praying for, your groanings, your, the size of your soul, they can, be, they can be offered up to God. They could be laid before him, and God has no problem in understanding what those groanings, what those sighs, what those cries are all about. So we get to cry out to God with expectation every day. So we, we have to be sure to cry out to him every day, which is why I love the fact that in, in verse 3 he mentions in the morning because this, this gives you a nice, quick, easy way to make certain that you are continuing to refresh your soul in a daily way. Every morning, cry out with expectation to your God. Every morning. Because the mornings are an absolutely great time to begin your soul work for the day. It's not where it ends, but it is an absolutely great way. Throughout history, the saints have woken up early. Jesus himself very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus went off to a solitary place to pray. Mark 1.35. This, this is a pattern that we see throughout the scriptures and throughout history. Many of you know we've got a pastoral leadership incubator going on. We started it last year. It's a three-year training curriculum designed to help us equip the next generation of pastors and associate pastors of care and future leaders uh, even throughout the area here at Beacon. And we're super excited about it. We're halfway through the first year. We just finished it, and the candidates are doing absolutely amazing. They're working real hard. Most of what we've talked about in the first half of this year has been soul care. How is it that we develop this very close, intimate relationship with God? How do we cultivate a prayer life? What does a devotional life look like? How do we refresh our souls? And one of the things that we come back to again and again, some of the readings mention it in many of our conversations, is that make it a daily practice. Start it in the morning. Before everything from your day starts to encroach and, and, and pull you away from focusing on God, cry out every morning and cry out expectantly. I love that part of this, uh, of this passage that we read expectantly. I don't know about you. Do you ever get a sense when you're, you know, you're in your room, you're praying, you're in your prayer closet, whatever that is for you. You're, you're in, it's early in the morning. You wake up, you start to pray, and suddenly it feels like someone painted your, your ceiling with like prayer proof paint or something like that, if there was such a thing. You know, like it just doesn't seem like your prayers get going. They don't seem like they're going anywhere. Sometimes we start to feel like he isn't really listening. Sometimes we question whether he is even there. And the psalmist says, no, 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 no. Cry out to him with expectation. And we'll see a little bit more later why. But here the encouragement is to simply remember that he is God, that he is powerful, that he, he promises to draw near to us. He listens. He acts on the prayers of his people. So we get to cry out with expectation. So we know all of this. Then why is it that we do not cry out to God? Why is it that we will go days or even sometimes weeks without really settling down, setting apart some time, examining our hearts and just laying it out before God. What is it that keeps us? And I think, we, it, I think some of the reasons are found in the next few verses. So look at verse 4 with me. He says, Oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore, 
the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. You will destroy those who tell lies. The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Now jump to verse 8. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. I think sometimes we don't cry out to God because when we feel attacked and when we are attacked and when we have all of this pressure from every side, when we feel these attacks, we often feel as if God has abandoned us. The psalmist will say it in many other psalms. We feel like God isn't actually here. You hear the story of Pastor Catherine and you're like, where was God in that? It would not have taken much to change the schedule and have some other people and to avoid that whole horrible attack. And I think these thoughts, when they go unchecked in our hearts, they begin to, to cause us to start to pull away from intimacy with God. I think David right now, as he's trying to, to reckon this, he's trying to wrestle through this, he's, he's acknowledging that he has these enemies and that he is under attack and he's still crying out to God, even though it doesn't always seem as if God is there. It seems as if he may be absent. You know, we, we all face many attacks from so many people over the course of our lives. There are mean people and there are bullies and there are co-workers who slander you and there are bosses who hit on you and then and hurt your career later on. There are spouses who have learned to emotionally bludgeon you. Can we really still trust that God is doing his work? Pastor Catherine, after the attack on her, she was really rattled to the core. She's, she said that uh, when I walk outdoors, I'm always looking behind me to see if anyone is following me. It's like a little PTSD thing going on. She's, she's just constantly thinking about it. She's always nervous about it. This has forever impacted her. And yet, she goes on to say that praying moment by moment, that's how she describes it, praying moment by moment, brought her the encouragement that she needed in order to press on and to be refreshed. See, we get to cry out despite, despite the attacks that you endure. And it's this kind of expectant crying out to God that enabled Pastor Catherine to continue the great work that she had begun, which she did. So, you know, we have these discipleship groups at uh, the church, and I've got my own discipleship group. They're little like triads, you know, a couple of people uh, paired with a disciple maker. They're the disciple ease, and, and uh, they last for like 18 to 24, even 36 months. And, and in there, we just share life, and we go through some books, and we look through some scriptures, and we do some scripture memory. And, we just, and these discipleship groups are, are designed to help uh, hold us accountable as we learn how to really grow in the Christian faith. And many people have reported some incredible growth that has happened through these discipleship groups. And so one of the things that happened was I uh, had my discipleship group, and it was just not even too long ago. And uh, I told them the week before, I said, hey, guys, listen, next week we're going to talk about our daily devotional time next week. So I gave them a warning, right? Because, of course, I know that if I give them a warning, they're going to do really extra good on it this week. And I'm trying to help them incur, you know, kind of help create these patterns because you're going you're gonna to talk about it. You're going to do extra good, right? So you're going to make sure you don't miss a single day and you're going to make sure that you were paying attention and you were learning in your devotions and all of this. And so, so we, uh, we did it I, and I did follow up the next week. I said, hey guys, how did, it, how did it go? And the guys were like, actually it went really, really good. Like I had more consistent days and more time and God really was like doing some stuff. And I was like, all right, this is so great. And they're like, and how about for you? And I'm like, 
you'd think, knowing we were going to have this conversation, it would be a good week. And it wasn't. It was a terrible week for me. And so we explored it together and kind of tried to figure out why was this last week particularly hard for me. And I realized that I'm getting frustrated with God. I was just, we have so much going on and our, our family has endured just a great deal of, of things happening and then all of the other stuff that's happening kind of in the world and impacting us from so many ways. And it's just like, and, I, and I'm, 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 I'm getting frustrated that God isn't keeping up his side of the bargain. And so, of course, as I'm, as I'm talking through this with him, I'm realizing, and there's a part of me that wants to pull away from God during those times. We have to cry out to God despite, despite the attacks that we are undergoing. And, of course, we're fighting a spiritual battle as well. See, there are even more insidious attacks from a more heinous enemy than the human, the mere human enemies that you wrestle against all the time. You see, there's a similarity between the language that the psalmist uses to describe the enemies of David and how the Bible describes our true enemy. For instance, in Revelation 12, it says the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in the heavens say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers. It sounds a lot like that kind of language. See, he's the original accuser. He is the original liar brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Listen, no matter what attack you face, whether it be from your human attackers or you know it is from the enemy, the great serpent who continually tries to accuse and twist the words and break down your soul, we get to cry out to God and we get to let him refresh our souls in the still, quiet moments of the morning and then throughout the day. We get to cry out despite the attacks, the attacks that you endure. Now, the psalmist here takes a little bit of a detour. I'm not going to be able to develop it too much. Uh, we should probably do it in a later week. But he even prays for God to destroy his enemies. And so it raises a couple of questions, right? What should we make of that? Should we start calling down fire from heaven upon the person who stole your account at work? I have this enemy and I've got this guy who isn't delivering what he said he was going to deliver. I have this guy who lied to me. I've got this boss who did. And God, I called out fire from heaven, kill these people. It doesn't exactly sound like the Christian way. And yet the psalms, these are called the imprecatory psalms, and David is the author of many of them. This one isn't even as, as aggressive as some of them get. And there's a lot to be said about these imprecatory psalms, but one of the things I wanted to highlight, and I can't go too far into it, is that it is right for Christians to pray against injustice, to ask for a change in the structures and in the leadership that brings oppression. It is right for us to pray against the, the, the bosses or even the co-workers, not praying fire from heaven. We'll talk, again, we should talk about this with more length. I'm almost doing it more harm than, than good by bringing it up. But it's important for us to recognize the place that these imprecatory psalms have because we are a people of justice. Catherine Wu, after her attack, national media picked it up. And things went absolutely crazy for her. The Taiwanese government, along with many other organizations and individuals, they responded with an outpouring of financial support for the center, the Good Shepherd Center that she had created. In fact, the government started taking action that would 
curtail the sex trade among the aboriginal people. So much so that it was within short order that the trade itself was eliminated and forced deeper and deeper underground where it would do even less harm as they continue to bring now political weight against it. There is a cry for justice and the hope that God will intervene and do what God does because we get to know that God hears these prayers and that there will be justice. Now, I think there's also another reason, and I think it's perhaps more common, that we don't cry out to God. I think it's because these descriptions, these disturbing descriptions of sin that we had just read a little bit ago, they're really about us. And I think this is troubling to us. For instance, in verse 9 of Psalm 5, it says, My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. This is the key. Listen to this phrase. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. Another translation puts it like this. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. For our Bible students, does this verse sound familiar to you? It does, right? Anyone remember where it's from? Romans 3. Why is that so troubling? Well, I'll read you the context. Romans 3, verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Do we, he's speaking about the, Jew, the Jewish people, do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jew and Gentile alike are, are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So when the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 5, he doesn't quote it about the wicked Romans or the people who judged Jesus and put him on the cross. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. He's directing it to you and me. That's a turn. We look at a verse like that, we look at a passage, and we want it to be about the other. But then Paul turns its focus on us. How can we possibly groan and sigh and cry and pray with expectation when we see the sinfulness of our own sin? The utter sinfulness of it. When we apply this kind of description to ourselves, see, that's a big problem. A lot of times we don't do that. A lot of times we think of the things that we do as just not so bad. And then Paul comes on the scene. He's like, what are you kidding me? You're a liar just like the people you were accusing. God ought to destroy you just like we were just praying he would destroy the wicked. That's what all of Romans 3 is about. How is it that we can cry out? We have to do it despite our failures. Despite our failures. Despite our sin. We need to cry out. How is it that we can possibly cry out to God when we come with this sort of a sin barrier? And what I love here is that the structure of the poem itself gives us the answer. Psalm 5 is laid out in this poetic way so that we actually get at the heart of the psalmist and the heart of the psalm 
and it resolves our tension. It's called a chiasm, and, and it's one of the many features of Hebrew poetry. We've talked about them in the past. There's some parallelism that's a key part of Hebrew poetry. There's some repetition, a little bit, little bit of alliteration and things like that. But, but this structure actually plays out in a beautiful way in Psalm 5. And so what you do is you take the first verses we looked at, and we call them line A, and it's the prayers of the righteous, and that's verses 1 through 3. And if you look through those verses, you'll see it's largely just the, the prayers of the righteous. It's the groanings of the righteous. Then we have this section 4 through 6 that tells us God hates the wicked. And as long as you think he's talking about someone else, that's good news. Because, you know, I'm up here praying with the righteous and all the wicked. They're down here in verses 4 through 6. You know, those are those kinds of people. Which, of course, now we see Paul is starting to take away from us the, the ability to hold to that. And then we get the, the, the C line of the chiasm where it says God's great mercy. Verse 7. We haven't looked at it yet. We're about to. But then we notice the repetition start. We're back to talking about the wicked. Verses 8 through 10. So now God drives the wicked away from him. So now we identify that God hates them. Now we understand what he does. He drives the wicked away from him. Now these lines match up. And of course, now by now you would have expected what's going to happen. It's going to end with a parallelism with the first few verses. So now we find the praises of the righteous in verses 11 through 12. This is a beautiful structure that's laid out. Now, remember, this is like before fonts, right? So you couldn't like bold and italicize and like throw, they didn't do punctuation like we do it. And so Hebrew poetry and many ancient forms of poetry had other ways of highlighting what they wanted to highlight. And this is one of those ways. The, the, the text itself, the structure points this beautiful arrow toward the center, the key verse. Verse 7, the verse about God's mercy. And he actually says, because of your unfailing love. Some translations say unfailing mercy. Your perfect kind of love. I can enter your house and I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Now here's what's something beautiful that takes place in this psalm. We saw that it started in the morning. And so scholars like to point out that now with his jump to the temple, to the worship life, the corporate worship life, he's going back to the morning offering where you would take an, an innocent, perfect sheep and you would sacrifice it for the sins of the nation. The ceremony is that, that people would use this for, for an atonement. You would actually take your hands and you would lay them on a sacrificial animal in a symbolic act of transferring your sin to the innocent animal. And then the punishment that you deserve would fall on that animal. They would sacrifice the animal. They would kill it. They would spill its blood. They would offer it up as a sacrifice to God in exchange for you. This is how you would achieve atonement, how your sins would be covered, how the wicked in our chiasm would actually be able to approach God. And so we get to see it. He, yes, God hates the wicked. God drives the wicked away. But God's great mercy will win the day. We actually get to see that, that play out. Even Catherine Wu, she said when she was asked why she returned to the mission of Good Shepherd, Pastor Catherine responded that Jesus loves those girls, and I love them too. Wait, do you mean you love them so much that you're willing to risk your life for them? You're willing to die? No greater love has anyone than this than to lay down their life for their friend. See, that's the kind of love that Jesus 
offered us, his great love. We go back into Romans now, and what do we hear? Romans chapter 3, verse 22. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is you, that is me, that is David. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Your offering in the morning, your prayers in the morning can boldly go before the throne of God because Christ has died on your behalf. Your sin never needs to be a barrier between you and God. You're doubting in his power, your doubt in his goodness, your apathy, your neglect. None of those sins and none of those challenges need to keep you from boldly going into the throne room of God. What we want to do is we want to beat ourselves. We want our sin to be such a big deal that we make such a big deal that we won't even be willing to go to God. And God is saying, are you kidding me? We've already paid your sin price at the cost of my son. You can now boldly go. Why? Because of his unfailing love. Because of Christ's unfailing love, you now get to cry out with expectant prayers no matter what you are facing. You now have bold access to God. The psalmist, he asked earlier on, he asked God to destroy those who tell lies. Destroy those who tell lies. You like that? I don't like that. I don't want God destroying those who tell lies. I'm in that category. You're in that category. So how is it that God actually destroys the one who lies? Well, we know. He poured out that destruction on Jesus at the cross so that we could get a new heart. You want to know how your lying, cheating, angry, judgmental, self-righteous self actually gets destroyed? You get a new heart. And God begins to deconstruct your sin nature. And he transfers not only your sin to the atonement sacrifice of Christ, but he transfers his righteousness to your account. The psalmist says, lead me in the right way. The word is righteousness. Lead me into righteousness. Well, we know through, from Romans how God leads us into righteousness. He leads us into Christ. And that leads us into righteousness. We get to cry out to God. And we get to cry out every morning and every evening in earnest and expectant cry because of the beautiful work of Christ on the cross. If you can claim God, as the psalmist does, as my Lord and as my God, then we get to grab the promises of verse 11, that he will be our refuge, that He'll be our protection, that he will surround us, that he will cover us so that we might sing for joy, that we might rejoice in him, that we might be blessed in his presence. Surrender your heart more fully and more completely to this great and unfailing love of God. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we cry out now. We cry out in expectation. We know that you tell us, you hear our prayers, and though sometimes we don't feel it, we trust you that you are there. Though we often feel alone, Lord, we trust that we are not alone because you have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, when our enemies seem to have the upper hand, we run back to you, asking that you would bring the justice that we deserve 
Father, when we fight against incredibly powerful systems of oppression that are far beyond what we can handle, Lord, we're asking that you would do the work that you do and that we would trust in it. Lord, no matter what part you have us play, that we would continue to trust and cry out to you. And Lord, though we know our true enemy is gunning for us, we need, we need not live in fear because you, Father, you are our refuge. You are our rock. And Lord, when we continue to drift away from you because of the sin that's in our hearts, because of the hardness, because of our rebellion, Lord, there is nothing that we have done that can separate us from your love. You recognize, Lord, you insist that we are not righteous and that we don't deserve your love. You above all know the, the, the penalty and the price that we ought to pay because of our sin and our rebellion against you. And Father, if we were to bear the weight, our souls would never be refreshed. And yet, as the psalmist tells us, because of your great love, because of this gift of atonement, the covering of our sin, the removal of our guilt because of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, Lord, we now get to live in the joy and in the power and in the comfort of your great love, your forgiveness. And we get to confess our sin and we get to leave it behind and we get to run back into the throne room of of our Father, the King. Knowing that you receive us with joy. Encourage and refresh our hearts and our souls. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.